Uh, this is a fun topic. It's kind of like talking about arts and crafts. Uh, this is one of my favorite techniques uh, to use to treat osteomyelitis uh, and also to prevent osteomyelitis and open fractures. Uh, I have a, a PowerPoint and I'm hoping that Dr. Lee will chime in too as I'm giving this presentation. And then I also put a little video together of the way that I like to make my antibiotic nails. Uh, so that's embedded in this talk too. I wanna first start by saying that this is an off-label use of these products. So it's important to have the conversation with your patients. You definitely can use them in this type of application. You just need to fully disclose the risks and benefits of that. Uh, so let's start with the case. This is a 35 year old male IV drug abuser, uh, heavy use of tobacco. He was a pedestrian struck by a car. The night he came in, I performed a pretty uncomplicated intramedullary nail, and then he was promptly lost to follow up. He returned at three months, uh, septic with an MRSA infection and purulence from the distal locking screw site. One of my colleagues was on call that night and she removed the hardware and performed an irrigation and debridement. And then he followed up with me in clinic and he was continuing to drain from the distal locking screw site. So you, you guys can kind of contemplate this case as we talk about antibiotic nails. So the advantages of using an antibiotic spacer, the big advantage is that you can deliver very high local concentrations of antibiotic without having to give it systemically. Uh, these are also good because it, it can manage dead space if you have a bone void. You can use equipment that's likely already at your hospital and it's pretty inexpensive. These spacers are easy to make, they're easy to insert, they're easy to remove, and they're highly effective. Uh, they can also create a, a bioactive induced membrane, which you can use later uh, to stimulate healing if you're going to apply bone graft into a void. And you can make them in any shape you want to. They can also be made in advance if you're running short on time. In my practice, the indications are really prevention of osteomyelitis in an open fracture situation or treatment of osteomyelitis in acute or chronic situations. Uh, they're also good in the, if you make a nail out of it, you can provide some fracture stability if your fracture hasn't completely healed and you can fill bone defects either temporarily or permanently. The contraindications are patient allergies. Obviously, if your patient is allergic to a particular antibiotic, you don't wanna deliver a high concentration of that into the patient. Also, there are times when the space is just too small and you can't fit anything in there. Slime producing bacteria are always a problem. They create a coating around your implant and they just don't work as effectively. And then vacuum dressings tend to just suck the antibiotic right out of the region. The components that you use are standard bone cement. Uh, the more porous, the better. Uh, it, you, the antibiotic that you use has to be a powder and it has to be heat stable because the exothermic reaction will kind of crush the antibiotic's ability uh, to kill the bacteria. You, the two I typically use are vanco and tobramycin. You can use, vanco comes about one gram per bottle and you can use two bottles of that per one bag of powdered cement. Uh, same with the tobra, you can use two bottles of that per uh, bag of cement. And then you need something that can provide some internal support for the cement spacer. You can either use a non-absorbable suture or a wire if, in the case of a nail. So with beads, they're fun to make. Uh, you just remove your existing hardware, perform your irrigation and debridement, and then you figure out how many beads or what, what shape beads you want. And then I tend to use a non-absorbable suture and just tie knots on the suture and then form the bead around the knot. They also have molds that you can use that are standard and you can just put the cement in the mold. So I made a video for you to show you how I like to make my antibiotic nail. I'm warning you, this video is only about five minutes long, but uh, video editing is not my forte. Uh, you'll see what I mean. The items you see on this table are really the only components required and likely exist at your institution already. First, I draw out of the back table the exact length that I'd like the nail to be. The large diameter chest tube is cut to length so that the portion of the tube with the holes is removed. Next, the ball tip guide wire is measured against the chest tube and bent to provide a hook on the end of the nail. 
This is made large enough for a bone hook so that it can be used for later extraction of the nail. The guide wire is bent and then clipped. When using the pliers, as is demonstrated, it's important to pinch the guide wire slowly so that it bends and doesn't break. This is particularly a problem with refurbished guide wires. The guide wire is then used for internal rebar support for the nail with the ball tip at the distal end of the nail. All profanity has been edited out of this video for your benefit. Okay, that's enough of that. You get the idea. The cement is mixed in any type of hand mixer with no vacuum used. The bubbles retained within the cement increase the porosity and help with the elution of the antibiotic. The more porous the cement, the better. You can use up to two bottles of powdered antibiotic per bag of cement. The powdered antibiotic does change the quality of the cement as it mixes, so I recommend using one additional bottle of monomer to ensure that it all mixes adequately together. Alternatively, some of the powdered polymer may be removed to account for the additional volume of powdered antibiotic that you're adding. standard fashion. The gun tip is shortened, then inserted into the flared portion of the chest tube. a bit of force to squeeze the cement into the chest tube and this frequently requires an assistant to hold the chest tube onto the cement gun so that it doesn't shoot across the rim. Once the chest tube is filled, then the guide wire rebar is placed within the column of cement, leaving the loop on the proximal end. If a bow or curve is desired, this can be held by hand until the cement starts to harden slightly. <laughs> Before the cement sets up completely, I recommend scoring the chest tube longitudinally with a 10 blade. The exothermic reaction of the cement will cause the plastic of the tube to melt to the cement, making removal of the chest tube extremely difficult. So do this fairly early in the process as the cement barely becomes gummy. Slicing the chest tube makes a relatively easy removal once the cement has hardened. Mineral oil may also be used to facilitate removal of the cement from the tube, but I don't routinely use this because I found it to be unnecessary and it can make it too slippery for the chest tube to remain attached to the cement gun as it is filled. As the cement becomes warm, the plastic tube is removed. A heavy suture is then tied to the wire loop, which also aids in later extraction of the nail. Educating the masses, guiding the classes, you ain't got glasses and you can't see what I'm talking about and never can hear. It's a love from time, it's a traditional, my mission, no relation, no sensation of this vibe. If you never find my soul getting lighter, the brighter, I set your pants on fire. If you listen like a dollar, put your socks in the dryer. 
one dog. The other man was a main man. There is all the skins getting bundled around. Prince of Ventura with the jazz and starts picking up on the beats. The final nail is approximately 9 to 10 millimeters at the distal end, flares up to approximately 12 or 13 millimeters at its proximal end when using a 40 French chest tube. <laughs> Okay, hope you all enjoyed my video. Uh, there's a lot of comments in the uh, panelist chat, so it, it sounds like everybody has their own favorite way of doing this. So I look forward to the comments in the end. Uh, I just also wanted to say that you can, you can use cement as the mask delay technique. This has been uh, classically described as uh, making a, a shape in the shape of your bone void. And then you leave that in place, filling the defect for about six weeks. Then you can go in and remove the cement and create, it creates a really nice uh, membrane that you can then fill with bone graft and that can lead to pretty good rates of union. Uh, the membrane is filled with all kinds of growth factors and proteins that encourage bone growth. And the initial um, results in the literature were, were super encouraging. Some of the more recent results haven't been quite as robust, but I still think this is a great technique and I've had success with this. Some of the complications of using cement spacers are that they can be difficult to retrieve, the, especially the longer you leave them in there. Uh, patients can have allergic reactions to these, even though I haven't seen that in my practice. Uh, there is the problem with resistant or recurrent infection, and I have at times had to go back in and do a whole other round of a cement spacer to, to get a complete, complete uh, resolution of the problem. And then there's always the chance of non-union or refracture with these injuries. In terms of re results, there's very little known about the actual clinical success rate for these. Uh, the induced membrane uh, technique has been pretty successful for achieving union. The best dilution of the antibiotic happens within the first four days. And after about six weeks, it doesn't really elute any more antibiotics after that. Uh, you can repeat the process if necessary. So getting back to the case that I started with, this um, patient who had the tibial nail and then showed up septic with the MRSA infection. Uh, when I saw this patient in clinic, I thought he would be a perfect candidate for an antibiotic nail. So I took him back to the operating room and washed him out again, irrigated him, reamed the intramedullary canal and made a cement nail. And his infection labs improved almost right away but he did continue to drain distally. So I recommended another round of this after the antibiotic eluded out of the nail. And I took him back at six weeks and did this uh, procedure again. And after we repeated the process, the drainage did resolve and his wound closed. So now I, I've seen him fairly recently and he's doing pretty well with no further signs of infection. He did heal his fracture, thankfully. And my second case that I wanted to share is a, a homeless male who had, he suffered this uh, proximal humerus fracture. And I performed his initial ORIF and he came back at two weeks with this catastrophic failure. I think in part because my fixation just wasn't robust enough, but he also, it was, uh, he had an overwhelming infection here and that led to very difficult uh, surgical decision-making. You know, you don't typically want to go in and put more metal in in this situation, but I just didn't think his fracture would heal without the additional stability of plates. So at two weeks post-op, I actually took him back and removed his plates, washed the fracture out, and fixed him again with a dual plating technique. And for him, I chose to make a cement spacer that I applied right against the plates. And uh, this cement spacer, I poked holes in it to try to increase the surface area of the spacer so that it would elute more of the antibiotics. And he came back uh, with the cement spacer eroding through the skin. He had some wound healing problems. So at that point, I decided to take that out and revise him to a, an intramedullary nail. Um, and I like that idea because it gave him some additional fracture stability. Uh, 
I left this in place for six weeks and then I took him back and put a titanium nail in uh, because I was worried that his fracture hadn't completely set up and he'd had a series of falls. Um, so that seemed to, to resolve his problem. I think in the future, the things that we'll be looking at are ways to increase the porosity of the cement so that it kind of creates, a, creates more surface area and allows the antibiotic to elute better. Um, the combination antibiotics, I think, might be helpful, helpful in the future, especially as resistance becomes more and more of a problem. Also, alternatives to typical bone cement, I think, are probably on the horizon, too. So in my hands, this is cheap and easy, and it works very well. Again, it is off-label, so you have to take that into consideration, but I've had very few complications with these procedures. Uh, Just but, a quick comment. Instead of using a guide wire, you can only use a threaded Elizrock rod, which is not what I've been using a lot. You can put an eyelet on the end of the rod so that you can pull the rod easier. You can also coat a, a regular end, a, a small uh, nail, uh, like an eight millimeter nail, and create an embark nail that way if you need fracture stability. Uh, the only key with that is pre drill your interlocking holes before the cement hardens. Uh, other than that, we do use mineral oil uh, with our chest tube. Uh, the plastic a lot easier, although lately uh, we've had a shortage of mineral oil, so we've actually gone to using surgery lube, which works fairly long, uh, fairly well. Nice. Yeah, I think they're so, just. I guess in the interest of time, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we have to move on, but uh, definitely. Uh, Really good comments. I think there are different ways to actually make a nail. I, I think it's just not one way, but whatever works in your hands and uh, does the job, I think is, is appropriate. So uh, I want to thank all the faculty that uh, participated in the session. Uh, I think it was great, great topics. And uh, I think we had some good discussion. So thank you for your time and the, and the work that you put in. So with that, I'll uh, send it over to, to John for the, for the next session. All right, buddy, you're up. Jackson, good to know that it's... Uh... Not just UCI, there's a shortage on mineral oil. I was, try, I was trying to figure that one out. I mean, I know COVID affects a lot of things, but I didn't know how it, it directly affected the, uh, the the availability of mineral oil for hospitals, but I guess so. So I guess it, I guess at SC as well. <laughs> that was a new one on me, but yeah, I, I didn't understand that one either. But surgery works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it, it definitely does.